A very good afternoon to everyone. I am Dr. Mona Prabhakar, Professor, Department of Orthodontics from Faculty of Dental Sciences, SGT University. We have been having a series of lectures on bioethics and the topic that I shall be taking up today is autonomy, informed consent and the right to withdraw. <coughs> the outline of my talk will start with the basic and general principles of ethics, then we shall discuss autonomy and then what are the key elements of informed consent and while we discuss informed consent, we will also focus on the right to withdraw. <coughs> what is autonomy? Autonomy is the basic principle of ethics. Informed consent is a very crucial part of biomedical research and it is grounded in the principle of ethics. E each and every research participant has the right to withdraw from research at any point of time after enrolling without giving any reason whatsoever for withdrawing and this fact has to be explained to the participant at the time when the informed consent is sought. So essentially these three things are linked and they are not separate topics per se. What is ethics? The subject of ethics in the words of Campbell et al can be thought of as the critical scrutiny of moral thought and morality as it affects our ideas of right conduct. In the words of words, it is a field of human inquiry that examines the basis of human goals and the foundations of right and wrong human actions that further or hinder these goals. So it is everything to do with the actions whether they are right or wrong. A recent process for dealing with the problem concerning what should be done or should not be done in a given situation. Now ethics, policy and law are closely intertwined to each other. We have policies or guidelines, but it is not possible to legislate each and every policy or guideline. So we have ethics. The role of law is just to administer justice and when should this justice be administered? It should be administered when, the, when we fail to follow the norms of ethics while doing any kind of biomedical research. So when the norms of ethics are violated, then the role of law comes in. Research. What is research? Research is a systematic investigation including research development, testing and evaluation. It is designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. Now human subjects in research. A human subject is defined as a living individual about whom an investigator, he may be a professional or a student, a person conducting the research obtains data or identifiable private sensitive information through intervention or interaction with the individual. Now research, this research can even obtain very sensitive data. Participation therefore, because sensitive data is involved, participation involves formal research protocols. Research protocols should be followed and these protocols have to be approved by an institutional review board or the ethics committee. So research is done basically to find answers to scientific questions. Now these questions for of research are important, they require answers and there is no other way in which these questions can be answered. But when we are doing the research, we must make sure that the benefits of the research are more than the risks. 
the benefits should definitely outweigh the risks and any kind of research this should be kept in mind is always done for the larger benefit of the society. So, we come to the basic principles of research, they are autonomy, when you are doing a research respect the people who are involved in it, beneficence it should always be for the good of the people, non maleficence this research or the outcome of the results should not do any harm to any subject whatsoever and you should always be just. You should not take advantage of the vulnerability of certain sections of society. Certain sections of society are always vulnerable and this is more applicable in India because a large part of the Indian population may be very poor. So, or they may be little children. So, these are the vulnerable sections of society and we should not target the vulnerable sections. Now, uh, ethics is nothing new in uh, biomedical research. Ethics has been practiced in traditional medicine and the rules of ethics are even found in the ancient Charaka Samhita given by Charak. So, in over there also the principles were similar. There is prime concern for the safety and the best interest of the patients. The research should be cost effective and the treatment provided should be very cost effective. We should never use very costly measures for terminal diseases or diseases that cannot be cured because that will become too expensive. While doing the research we must maintain confidentiality. We should refrain from any kind of advertising or offering any inducements through financial deals and always there should be an element of professionalism with patients or with colleagues. So, it all started after World War II with the introduction of the Nuremberg Code in 1947 and the Nuremberg Code came into being because of the various atrocities that were done with prisoners of war especially in Germany. This was followed by a further improvisation with the declaration of Helsinki in 1964. So, ethic guidelines in India are pretty strong. Every clinical tri trial program which is done in an institute has to be further priorly reviewed by an institutional ethics committee or the ethics review board or the research ethics board or an independent ethics committee. So, this institutional review board is commonly referred to as IRB or IEC institutional ethics committee. This institutional ethics committee it reviews the proposed research protocols and not only reviews before the research begins, but even during the research they have to constantly monitor the program. The responsibility of this committee is that it protects the dignity, the rights and well-being of the subjects, ensures that universal ethical values are taken care of, it assists in the development and education of research community. It is comprised of 8 to 12 members. Uh, the chairman is from outside the institution, one or two members from medical sciences, one or two clinicians from various institutes, one legal expert, a social scientist, a philosopher or a bioethicist, one lay person from the community and a member secretary is also there. Now, uh, to further enforce that ethics are followed, a bill has come into being and this is the biomedical research bill on human subjects. It has, it was first introduced in 2005 and then it was revised in 2013. It was proposed by the Ministry of Health to oversee the functioning of institutional ethic committees in various institutions. 
the scope of this bill is it promotes and regulates biomedical and behavioral research on human subjects so that they are safe and the well-being of the subjects is ensured. This has specially come into being with the advent of new therapies and new technologies like stem cell research, like stem st uh, cell research, therapeutic cloning and the human genome project. Because of these new technologies, this bill has come into being and it was thought very important. So, to restrict unscrupulous clinical trials on unsuspecting patients. It also gives legislative power to the ICMR or Indian Council of Medical Research ethical guidelines which have been formulated under the chairmanship of Justice M. N. Venkata Chalaya, former Chief Justice and Chairman of National Human Rights Commission of India. They have proposed the setting up of a national biomedical research authority to overlook the institutional ethic committees. So, the basic guidelines, these are the basic guidelines and we shall be discussing them in detail. So, you have essentiality, sorry, see we have essentiality by this we mean that the research should be done only and only if it is essential. Then you have voluntary, voluntariness, by this me, we mean that the consent which is given by the subject should be totally voluntary. It should not, there should not be any exploitation of the subjects, data obtained should be kept private and confidential. The outcome of the study or the research should have minimum risk for the patients. The patient, the people who are carrying out the research or the researcher should be competent and even the person who is giving the data should understand each and every uh, aspect of his role as a participant. It should be, the researcher has to be accountable, the research should be transparent. It should involve maximization of public interest, so it should be beneficial. There should be adequate institutional arrangements, the institution carrying out the research should have good infrastructure, adequate infrastructure to carry out that research. The results of the research should be available in the public do domain, it should be an open access research. The researcher has to take total responsibility and compliance, they should be, they should comply with the guidelines. So, now we shall discuss autonomy in greater detail. In the words of Spinoza, that person is considered free, who lives with free consent under the guidance of reason. Autonomy is one of the four major principles of healthcare ethics. According to Beauchamp and Childress, Current concepts of autonomy stem from the Greek definition, literally it means self-rule and self-determination. The healthcare system's position on this principle is supported by Kant and Frankel and others who believe that because people have unconditional worth, you cannot uh, quantify the worth of an individual life. So, because people have unconditional worth, they should be given respect and they should be able to take decisions on their own. So, they also deserve self-determination. When we apply the principle of autonomy, we assume that any person is free from the control of others and has the capacity to make his own life choices. A person has the right to hold views that are incongruent with those of the healthcare establishment. This is the basic principle of autonomy. For example, you are a Jehovah's Witness. What do I mean by Jehovah's Witness? Jehovah's Witness is a community of Christianity which does not follow the regular doctrines of Christianity. 
So, they are different, they do not follow the principles, regular principles of Christianity and they are a sect of their own. So, if you are a Jehovah's witness and you do not believe in blood transfusions, you have every right to refuse such treatment when the physician recommends it. So, the word choice is a key element in this principle. Autonomy is more than just making informed choices. It is also concerned with how individuals are viewed and treated within the healthcare system. Autonomy as informed consent. Legal and ethical considerations come together when applied in the area of informed consent for treatment. Through case, law and legislation, informed consent has come to be seen as the duty of physicians or the people designated by them to obtain the patient's permission for treatment. This permission should be given only and only after the patient has understood what the treatment involves and he supports the implementation of the treatment. Failure to obtain this permission can constitute negligence and it can even lead to medical malpractice actions. From a larger view, informed consent is an ethical issue because it requires respect for autonomy of individuals and their right to choose what is done to their bodies. Now, autonomous consent is sometimes implied. And how is it implied? Through the action of people. For example, if you have taken an appointment with a dentist and you go to the dentist for your appointment, that means your consent is already there. However, if a procedure has to be done that is not routine, then there is an ethical binding on the person pro performing that procedure to first obtain a specific written consent from the patient. Now, this kind of permission to treat has a precondition that the patient who is giving the consent or the individual who is giving the consent is competent enough to understand the steps of the treatment and it also includes a voluntariness on his or her part when they decide to undergo the treatment or participate in the research. Also, it requires that the physician should fully disclose all the information in the recommended treatment plan. Finally, consent means that the patient is in favor of the plan and he has given his or her authorization to the doctor or the researcher to proceed with the research or with the treatment. Now, if a healthcare professional tries to manipulate a person into consenting for a treatment, this negates autonomy. Now, an example of this is that a researcher needs certain number of subjects in order to maintain funding for his study. The funding will come only if he has a certain number of subjects. Then the researcher makes some promises to a patient so that the patient participates in the study. The subject signs a consent form without knowing what is the true agenda of the researcher. This kind of manipulation of, of giving false, giving some promises to the patient or some benefits to the patient just to enroll more patients for a research in order to get some funding is manipulation. This manipulation is unethical and it removes the voluntary element from the process of informed decision making. Disclosure as we discussed earlier is a major element in both legal and ethical as aspects of informed consent. Autonomy also involves confidentiality. It is practice when the information of a person's identity, family, health status and treatment procedures is kept private. This especially holds true with certain diseases which hold a stigma associated to them 
for example, it may be HIV, tuberculosis. So, all information has to be kept private. Autonomy includes truth telling. Truth telling or veracity is a key part of the business of healthcare. When patients interact with a person in healthcare system, they assume that they are being told the truth by the researcher or the doctor. Likewise, practitioners also assume that truthful information is being given to them by their patients. Confidence in truthfulness is the basis of trust that underlies decisions for effective treatment. At no point of time should there be a breach of trust. There can be different standards about the scope of truth telling and this is quite challenging especially when we are dealing with the diagnosis and subsequent prognosis of a condition. Now, if a, pa a patient has a very severe kind of disease or a very serious disease, the patient can be told the full truth about his disease and the various treatment options. But what will happen under various treatment options or what will happen after each step of treatment, here the practitioner can use his discretion and give information step wise. Why should this be done? Because if we give all the information, sometimes the patient gets overly alarmed. To avoid overwhelming the patient, the practitioners can choose to give information in pieces over a period of time. This decision is justified and it can be considered ethical because no one ultimately knows how a person will respond to treatment. There is something known as variable patient response. The same treatment given to one patient, he may respond very well, while the same treatment given to another patient the patient may not respond. So, variable patient response is something that you cannot predict. So, there is no point telling about the side effects of a treatment to a patient beforehand. Some idea can be given because if you tell everything, sometimes the patient gets overly alarmed. Now, autonomy as fidelity. Fidelity is nothing but sticking to your word or promise keeping. The community considers it a norm that you will keep your word and treat patients with dignity and fairness and provide care that is appropriate and effective. So, the salient features of autonomy. Autonomy as a principle of ethics assumes a certain level of respect for persons and their ability to take actions that affect their health. It includes issues of informed consent, confidentiality of information, truth telling and promise keeping. In healthcare, this is sometimes quite difficult. It is not easy at all because we often confront challenging situations. That time it is our responsibility <coughs> to be aware that these challenges are within our organization and we should do whatever we can as a service provider to maintain the right of autonomy of the consumer, the patient or the participant in the medical research. The community and our employees expect this from us. <coughs> now we come to the next topic informed consent and we will con discuss it in detail. By definition, this means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give the consent. We will discuss what is legal capacity. The person should have legal capacity to give consent. The person should be so situated so as to be able to exercise free power of choice without intervention of any element of force, any fraud, duress overreaching or other ulterior form of con constraint or coercion and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the participant matter involved so as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. 
So, this is a very long decision uh, definition, I will try to focus on the important aspects. Legal capacity, so legal capacity means the person should be in the should have enough IQ level and should be of a particular age, so that he can give the consent. Should be situated in a position to exercise free power of choice, so that means the in consent when it is given should be absolutely voluntary, it should never be given under pressure. And the last aspect, the person should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension. So, that is the duty of the researcher to make the patient understand what is the research about. Once the patient has understood everything, only then the patient gives the consent. So, the person should fully understand the process and then only he can participate in making choices about his health care and participation in the research. So, this has legal and ethical aspects because he has full right to know what is going to happen to his body and it, this is the moral obligation of the physician or the researcher to involve the patient in this way. Now, the informed consent document has two parts, one is the participant information sheet abbreviated as PIS and the informed consent form abbreviated as ICF. The participant information sheet includes information on known facts about the research which has relevance to participation, so it carries all the information. The informed consent, here the patient acknowledges that he has understood the information given in the participant information sheet and after understanding he is volunteering to be included in the research. This is a moral obligation because morally it is necessary for us to respect the persons who are participating in the research. We should not act against an individual's wish, we should respect the wishes, if they do not wish to participate we cannot include them in the study. So, that is why consent has to be obtained, legally it is a required, it is required legally and uh, for this various ethical guidelines have been formulated certain laws have been formulated and you have these are known as human right laws. They are informed consent, the consent should be informed, you should have provided all the information to the patient, it should be given voluntarily, under it the patient should not be under any pressure or duress, no inducements should be offered and most important the patient should have the capacity to understand each and everything before they give the consent. Now, unfortunately the concept of legality has become more important than morality in taking informed consent. The informed consent forms or the documents that we commonly see are so elaborate, they are so detailed, they contain a lot of jargon and why it contains uh, so much of jargon and why it is so detailed because everyone wants to save their own skin. The researchers want that no, uh, they should not face any complications later on. So, the emphasis is primarily to watch your back. So, getting the consent just signed becomes more of a formality. We never ensure that the participant has understood the part, his role in the research without explaining commonly anything to the participant, we just give them a form whether they understand it or do not understand, they are just asked to sign it. So, it is basically a mere formality performed by someone. Sometimes the patient or the participant in the research does not even understand English because some of these informed consent documents are in English that is not right, they should be in the local language. 
community versus individual consent. Now, the setup of our society is such the our culture is such our socio cultural trends is such that they pose a very unique challenge, especially in India. We have seen that uh, the village in villages especially the panchayat has a very important role to play and in big families the elders of the family have an overruling over whatever is done by the family members. Uh, community leaders, gatekeepers, gatekeepers are those or doctors who are appointed by insurance companies who further direct patients that what all uh, investigations they can go off or go, go forward with or what benefits they can avail. So, they also have an influence. Now, uh, because of this uh, community aspect, individual consent is obtained, but in such cases a community consent should also be obtained, especially if it is a village setting. For example, you talk to the prior, you talk to the panchayat people telling them that why it is necessary for the person to participate in the research, what the person will be undergoing. It is not necessary to have that in written, it can be done verbally and it can be done prior, but after doing that then you have to obtain consent at the individual level. So, community consent precedes the individual consent and it does not have to be documented, but sometimes it is required keeping in view our socio-cultural trends. Also we have a hierarchical society where a large part of the population is illiterate. So, th the patients just delegate the responsibility to the physician, wo kehte hain, doctor aap, doctor sahab aap jante ho kya theek hai, aap jo, jo aapko theek lagta hai, wohi karo. So, th because of the hierarchical society, they delegate their autonomy to the physicians or to the male member of the family or to the elders of the family. In especially in case of women living in our villages, this right to participate or refuse to participate is severely curtailed. So, informed versus understood. Many times the consent is informed, but it is not understood. Why? Because they do not understand the intricacy of research. They are a large part of our population is illiterate. So, they do not comprehend the intricacies of research. So, it is informed, it is signed by them, but maybe they have not understood it no genuine efforts are made to make them understand, because for this you need manpower, you need people to go from house to house to spend time with the villagers and make them understand what is the, their role in participation. And the researchers who are doing it, they are the most junior members in a setup and sometimes they are even untrained people who have no knowledge about the research and they are going and taking the consent from the illiterate population. And the language that is never simple, it is too complicated, neither the person who is taking the consent understands it, nor the person who is giving the consent understands it. So, it becomes just informed, it is never understood. When we come to compensation versus coercion, now we must understand uh, there is ours is a very poor country and because of the poverty uh, the participants sometimes become vulnerable. Uh, they do not understand the risks involved in the research and uh, they may expose themselves to this risk and they may give their consent for participation without understanding the risks. Uh, they think that they are getting some benefit, so that some benefit is better rather than not getting any benefit from the treatment. And then there is therapeutic misconception, I like to explain this term. The, it is the responsibility of the researcher to explain to the patient that the outcome of the research, the result is going to be a generalizable knowledge. It has nothing to do with his or her treatment. 
So, sometimes patients think that just by participating in the research, they are going to get some therapeutic benefit. This fact should be made clear to patients that the research is for generalizable knowledge and it has nothing to do with the treatment of that patient. So, this therapeutic misconception should be allayed. Western standards in uh, countries, the western countries very often certain incentives are offered to the participants for taking part in the research. Uh, because when somebody comes uh, repeatedly for uh, investigations or for providing data, they have to there is some amount of loss of earnings involved. They may have to take leave from where they work they may lose a day's pay, they have to travel long distances. So, they, there is a loss of earnings, they have to encounter inconvenience, maybe they have to travel by buses from a very far distance. So, some uh, amount of reimbursement should be given to them to cover up for the loss of earnings, for the travel expenses and some post trial benefits should be offered to them. If this is given in adequate amounts to cover up for these expenses, it is known as reimbursement, but when it is out of proportion, then it becomes an inducement. So, we must learn to differentiate what is reimbursement and what is inducement. While reimbursement is ethical, inducement is unethical. So, what should be required in an informed consent? it should be voluntary and it should be obtained in any kind of biomedical research which involves human participants. It is based on the principle that competent individuals, competent those who understand, they have the freedom to choose if they wish or not to participate or continue to participate in the research. Remember it is a continuous process it is not a single event. It is a continuous process with three main components, providing relevant information, ensuring competence of the participants, ensuring comprehension and assuring voluntariness. While doing this, we protect the individual's freedom of choice and we also respect their autonomy. It is necessary because of certain patient factors in our country like severe poverty, limited option to the patients, the illiteracy in our country and large numbers of patients that we have to deal with. Because of this, these laws have come into being, otherwise consent is sometimes taken for granted, it should not be taken for granted and these are the factors why we tend to take it for granted. Also, the submissive attitude and the restrictive environment in which the participants stay. There are certain institutional factors, all institutions do not have adequate manpower, they have manpower limitations because they have time constraints, shortage of resources. There is a paternalistic attitude of doctors and researchers that it is ok, what we are doing is fine there is no need for taking consent, but that should not be so. And one can be a basic lack of knowledge or insight into the principle of ethics. If this is so, then this is not unethical, but now it is mandatory that everyone should comply with the ethic guidelines for biomedical research. So, there are various aspects of uh, uh, informed consent. We will like to see what are the various aspects of consent, what are the aspects of assent and what is assent, in which situations we have to take electronic consent, in which situations we can waiver the consent, when do we have to take a re-consent and special situations. Essential information we had already discussed that is a participant information sheet and signing that document. Now, adequate time should be given to the participant to read the information sheet, discuss his role as a participant 
with his family and friends, they have every right to consult their family before they participate in the research. And this time should be given to them. It is very essential for them to understand the key elements. So, uh, it should include the following. It should include the statement mentioning that it is a research. This should be informed to the patient right in the beginning. There should not be any therapeutic misconception. The patient should know that it is a research. The purpose and methods of the research should be explained in simple language. What will be the duration of the research or the participation of the patient? How many times the patient will have to come to provide data? The total number of participants that will be enrolled in the study, the kind of data that they will be collecting and the methods they will employ in the study. What will be the benefits to the participant or to the community? This may also be discussed or dwelt upon with the patients. If there are any foreseeable risks, any inconvenience that the participant will face, this should also be enlightened to the participant. To what extent can you maintain confidentiality of the records or the data obtained? Your ability to safeguard it and if there is a breach of confidentiality, then what will be the consequences? This should be explained to the patient. You should also tell them whether they will get reimbursement and how much it will be for the expenses that are incurred by them to participate in the study. We should make every effort to provide free treatment or compensation for participants in case they suffer some injury during the process. This is very important, the right to withdraw, the freedom of the individual to participate or withdraw from the research at any time without any penalty or loss of benefits should be made clear. This is an assurance that we have to give the patient that there will be no penalty or no loss of benefit to the patient if they wish to withdraw from the study at any point of time. The uh, people who are in the research team, the identity of the research team, the contact persons, addresses, phone numbers of the principal investigator, the co-principal investigators should be given to, to the patient so that the patient can freely contact them or consult them whenever he feels that the ethical principles of the study are being violated. A helpline should be provided to the patient. Some more responsibilities, as we have discussed that the participant should be competent, should have understood everything, give the consent voluntarily. Now, to sometimes we have to test this, so for this we administer, we have to, uh, we have to test whether the participant has understood and for this we administer a test of understanding. A test of understanding can be done to see whether the participant has understood and this is specially for the sensitive study and these tests may be repeated till you are assured that the participant is completely understanding each and everything about the study. Now it comes to the uh, different situation, sometimes the participant is willing to participate but does not want to sign the consent form or even give a thumb impression. Then in such cases a verbal consent can be taken as an approval by the ethics committee in the presence of an impartial witness. If the participant does not want to sign or give a thumb impression, a witness should be called an impartial witness. The witness will sign the consent form, the consent document. And uh, this process of the witness being present or signing the document has to be recorded through audio or video recording. And the researcher, the participant and the witness should all be in the same frame. 
So, it should be documented through audio and video recording. Verbal or oral consent, it should be avoided. It is uh, generally believed that such things should be avoided. It should be done only in exceptional cases. Now, if the protocols of the study change, then a reconsent is called for, because uh, what are the changes in the study that has to be informed to the patient. Now, the patient should have the confidence that if they withdraw from the study, this will not alter the benefits to which they are entitled in what was promised to them in the beginning of the study, they will yet get those benefits and none of those benefits will be withdrawn if they refuse to participate further. And reimbursement has to be given, so that they do not incur loss due to participation in the study. If they get some injury during the study, then the researcher has to pay the expenses for their treatment. In fact, this is so important that uh, for studies which are done in utero, even the unborn baby has a right to claim uh, reimbursement if he develops some kind of congenital anomaly or some kind of birth defect. Even the unborn baby has this right. Now, documentation of the informed consent. Each participant has to sign the informed consent after going through the whole process. If the patient is medically or uh, is incompetent, that is, he is medically compromised, he is physically disabled, then a LAR, LAR is the legally authorized representative. The consent of the legally authorized representative has to be taken. If the patient is or the participant is illiterate, then the legalized, legally authorized representative uh, should be there and this person has to be a literate person who is not related to the participant in any way. So, uh, In case of an illiterate, in case of illiterate participants, a legally authorized representative should be witness by an impartial literate witness not related to the participant and who is no way connected to the conduct of the research. Now, this uh, impartial witness it can be a patient, any other patient in the ward who is not involved in the study or it can be a staff from an NGO. So, they, they can be counsellors, social counsellors. This witness should be a literate person who can read the participant information sheet and consent form and understand the language of the participant. So, in case of illiterate participants, we have to observe these rules. So, uh, another factor is that if the participant cannot sign, obtain thumb impression, the this is important, the researcher must also sign and date the consent form. For all institutions, in addition to the legalized, legally authorized representative, permission for conducting the research should be obtained from the head of that institution. In some types of research, even the permission of the spouse has to be taken. In case of genetic research, members of the family may become the secondary participant, if their details are given as part of the research. If information about second degree participants is also required for this research, then their informed consent will also be required. Now, in certain kind of mass surveys, we need, we like to give electronic consent forms. So, how do we do documentation in electronic consent forms? 
online consent can be obtained in research and we generally uh, employ this kind of online research in when we have to obtain very sensitive data. Now, sensitive data example when we are doing a research on unsafe sex, on high risk behaviors, on the use of contraceptives, on emergency contraceptive pills among unmarried females in India, this is all sensitive data. So, for such surveys we may do use an online process and when we use an online process then we have to have electronic consent. Now, while we do this it is very important that we ensure the privacy of the participant and confidentiality of the data which we obtain in the online surveys. Electronic media can be used to provide information in the written informed consent document. This is administered and documented using electronic informed consent systems. These are electronic processes that use various multiple electronic formats. These formats can be these these formats can be in the form of text, graphics, audio video, podcasts or interactive websites to explain the information related to a study and to document informed assent or consent from a participant or uh, an LAR. Now, electronic consent. In electronic consent what is important is to what equipment will be used, the documentation, privacy of the patient, confidentiality of the information obtained and how you are going to store that data so that it is secure and does not get leaked and data use policies whether is that data going to be used in future for more research all this must be first reviewed and approved by the ethics committee a priori. So, all this has to be done priorly by the ethics committee and then it can go online for survey. It should be in a language same as is applied to written consent, it should be in a language easily understood. The principal investigator should des, uh, supervise the entire uh, process even if it is electronically mediated. A paper copy or a soft copy will have to be archived for the participants. Interactive formats, sometimes interactive formats are used, but these formats should be very simple to understand and easy for the participant to navigate. Electronic methods should not be used at any point of time if the participant feels that he cannot, he finds it very difficult to use electronic media, uh, media then this should not be forced on them. In such cases, then a written consent only is required. Waiver of consent, in which situations is can the consent be waived? In in uh, we waive the consent if the study involved has minimal risk to the participant and the waiver will not adversely affect the rights and the welfare of the participant. The electron the ethics committee can grant consent waiver in the following situations. Firstly, if the research cannot be carried out without waiver then it is justified. Retrospective studies where you cannot even identify the subjects, there a waiver can be issued. Research involving anonymous biological samples, where there is no leakage of the identity of the participant. Public health studies, surveillance programs and program evaluation studies, where the number of participants is so large that there is no risk of identification. Research on data available in the public domain. The data is already in the public domain and it is used for research. Research during emergencies and disasters. In such a situation, the participant may not be in a position to give consent because of the emergency situation. In such cases, the research can be done, but at the earliest opportunity, the participant's consent should be obtained. When is re-consent required? 
when there is new information that changes the risk benefit ratio. If you feel that the benefits have decreased, the risks have increased, then you have to inform the patient and take a reconsent. Initially, when you started the study, the participant was incompetent or incapable of understanding the participant information sheet. Later on, he becomes competent, so the consent has to be repeated. If a child becomes an adult during the course of the study, if the research is so long that it requires long term follow up, then from time to time a reconsent should be taken. Change in the treatment modality, procedures, site visits, data collection, methods or tenure of participation. Possibility of disclosure of identity, identity of the patient through the data in the form of photographs in any upcoming publication. So, if you plan to publish the study and the identity of the patient may be revealed through the publication of photographs in a paper, then it is very necessary that before you publish the photographs of the patient consent, a written consent has to be taken. In many studies, it has been seen that the spouse is also required to give uh, reconsent, not only the participant, the spouse also has to give reconsent. Now, post consent procedures, uh, the participant should be given a copy of the participant information sheet and signed informed consent form. If the patient is unwilling to keep a copy, the reluctance of the participant for this should be recorded. The researcher has an obligation to convey details of how confidentiality is going to be maintained. So, they should explain what kind of measures they are going to take so that the identity of the patient will remain undisclosed. The original information sheet and the informed consent form has to be archived. These are the requirements given in the guidelines and regulations. There are special situations we have already discussed when a community consent has to be preceded has to precede the individual consent, but the community consent need not be verbal, it need, need not be written, it need not be written, it can be just verbal and it does not have to be documented always. And consent from vulnerable population groups, in such case we have to take extra measures. Then there are certain things known as deception studies. As I explained that when we have to tell the effect of a treatment, we may unnecessarily make the patient anxious or overwhelm the patient. So, in such cases, an initial consent is give, uh, taken from the patient and as the research proceeds, as the research proceeds or as the treatment proceeds, the patient is debriefed. So, initial consent and debriefing this is a known as a two step consent and it is done in certain cases of deception studies, but there should not be unjustified deception, undue influence and intimidation of the patient to participate in the study. Such things should be avoided at all costs. So, ICMR guidelines have explained whatever has been discussed today in great detail. ICMR guidelines were revised in 2017, they are available on the website and you can go through it all these principles in detail. It is it covers everything that we have discussed today and the uh, topic of informed consent has been discussed specifically in chapter 5 of ICMR guidelines revised in 2017. It contains all the points that we have discussed. So, current trends and emphasis, you must understand it is not a one time event, it is a process. Informed consent is a process, it is just not a piece of paper. It must be obtained in a manner that allows the participant to voluntarily agree or decline to participate. It should not be informed, it should be an understood cons consent. They should understand each and every word or their role in participating in a study. 
So, for this the script has to be in a language which is easily understood by the participant. Generally, it is considered that a seventh grade child, even a seventh grade child should understand, uh, should be able to read and comprehend what is written in the participant information sheet. So, it should be of the IQ level of a seventh grade child only then it can be comprehended by the general public and it should include all basic elephants of informed consent. So, how do we go about it? It can be written preferably written sometimes it can be ver verbal if it is verbal then it has to be witnessed and recorded. It is administered by the people directly involved the researchers. We should give more funds for this process because uh, it is a time consuming process, it involves a lot of effort going and making the patient understand what the study is, more human resources and it should be conducted in small groups and it should have multiple sessions. Why should it have multiple sessions? So, that you understand the patient understands it and to know that the patient has understood it or the participant has understood it we administer test of understanding. So, it should never be done in a haste, it should be done over a period of time. How do we know that they have understood it? Make the form simple, give only brief and crucial information, the language should be easy. If it is too difficult, it will take away the crucial information, the crucial information will not be understood. For this you have to train some people who will carry out this function and these people should ideally be those from the local area. If it is in a village setting, you should recruit people from the villages. You can also use uh, flip charts, video animations, skits and street plays when a village is going to participate in the uh, research study. So, you can collectively disseminate the uh, information by means of these modes. Then these things should be frequently repeated, then they should have a lot of time to think over before they give their consent. And finally, you should test their comprehension of the study. Children require special protection while giving consent. Um, it has been seen that before if you do you are doing any kind of research there are social justice requires that a distinction be drawn between classes of participants that should participate or should not participate in the study based on the ability of the class to bear the burden of the study. Thus, we see that there is always an order of preference in the selection of the subjects that will participate in the study and it is a general principle that uh, it is a general principle that we prefer that adults be considered for the study rather than children. If children have to be uh, participating first, we have to evaluate whether is, if adults cannot participate, only then children should be included in the study. From children, we should discuss what is assent. Assent is a child's affirmative agreement to participate in research mere failure to object may not without affirmative agreement be construed as assent. So, what does this mean? Uh, the child has to give not just objecting, the child has to agree in the affirmative before he participates in the study. So, assent uh, is taken depending how old the patient is or the participant is. If the participant is less than 7 years of age, then you take a written consent from the parents or the legally authorized representative. If the child is 7 to 12 years, then an oral assent can be taken from the parent or the LAR. If the child is 12 to 18 years, then a written assent is taken from the child and a consent is taken from the parents or the LAR. So, 
not only does age matter, we have to consider other factors like maturity and psychological state. When can assent be waived? Like consent can be waived in certain situations, assent can also be waived. When the capability of the participant to understand is limited, in we as we have seen in the previous slide, below the age of 7, uh, we take a consent from the parent or the LAR. And if the intervention is such that it directly benefits the child, then the child can participate in the clinical trial that there is definitely going to be some benefit. In such cases, we can just waive the requirement for assent. Whatever be the situation, the parental or the LAR consent will always be required. So, we have just discussed other waivers can be that it is the child is at minimal risk, the investigation is of minimal risk. It will not adversely affect the right and welfare of the participants. The investigation cannot be conducted without the waiver. So, these conditions are quite similar to the waivers for consent. When required, the participant will be given additional pertinent information after the participation. In all situations, the same, the consent from the parents or the LAR is required. Now, why should we get assent from children? It has various benefits. Assent reminds us that children should always be treated with dignity and respect. When we give them a role in decision making, that means we are treating them as autonomous individuals. Requirement of assent serves to remind parents and investigators that children are also people with interests and they are not mere vessels for the purpose of research. An assent requirement offers school age children the opportunity to learn the meaning of respect for others. So, we serve as role models when we take assent from them. We teach them also how to respect other individuals. So, in summary, what did we discuss? We discussed the responsibility of researchers. It is the importance of translations, why to do the test of understanding, what we should do for people who are differently abled or incompetent to give consent. We should give adequate time for the patients to understand the information sheet provided to them and then take a decision on their own. No intimidation or coercion should be done for the participant to participate. In certain situations, we may require an LAR or an impartial witness. In such cases, it should always be documented. If it is written, uh, it should be documented and if it is not written, if it is verbal, then an audio visual recording of all the people involved should be there. In some special situations, we may require electronic consent where sensitive data is uh, involved. In some situations, we discussed in which situations waiver of consent, re-consent and uh, is required and when we have to take community consent along with individual consent and what are deception studies and how do we go about taking consent in deception studies. Now, the main source of re reference is this manual which is available on ICMR website. It is the National Ethical Guidelines for Biomedical Research, Biomedical and Health Research involving human participants. These guidelines have been framed under the ABLE guidance. They have been uh, formulated under the ABLE leadership and guidance of Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who is the Director General of ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research. In the end, I would like to acknowledge all my source of information and uh, the help that I got from Dr. Nalan Mehta. He is a professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. 
he is a bioethicist, bioethicist and uh, he has done his course on bioethics from University of Toronto, Canada. So, he really helped me out in providing the necessary information and I am very thankful to him. Thank you.